there is um, there is nowhere in the country where the vibrant relationship between a university and the field of practice is being exhibited better than at the University of Cincinnati. Um, when we envisioned this first two-day conference, we um, wanted to talk about uh, we wanted to, we wanted to um, model what is possible when um, we bring together the university agenda and the effectiveness agenda in the, in the world. Um, and I can think of no better example of a place where this is uh, being done extremely, with extreme effectiveness and, and profound importance than at the University of Cincinnati. Ed Lasessa uh, has been uh, developing the relationship between the School of Criminal Justice there and the uh, and, and not, not just in the state of Ohio, but nationally in the field of corrections and, and law enforcement since he's headed up the program uh, more than 20 years ago. So um, I, it is my distinct uh, pleasure to be able to introduce to you, Ed, by the way, there's no stranger in Jersey comes here all the time, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you uh, Dr. Ed Latessa from the University of Cincinnati. Thank you, Todd. If you don't mind, I'm not going to see it up there. I might fall off. Um, it's, it's, it's nice to be here. Todd is, a, is an old, old friend. We go back many years. And when we just celebrated the 20th anniversary of our PhD program in Cincinnati, and Todd was, was uh, gracious enough to come in and, and be our keynote speaker. And so uh, that meant a great deal to us. So when he called and asked if I would come and do this, I of course, uh, was more than happy to reciprocate, uh, not only to, to, to come and help uh, them do this good work, but also to see a lot of, uh, uh, many of you I know have probably, you know, heard me more than you, you care to remember. Um, and, and I'll try not to bore you too, too much. I, I've only got about here to do that. Um, and, and I'm going to come up at it a little bit differently. I know when he called, he asked me, he gave me some very specific uh, topics to talk about, and, and I kind of forgot what they were, so I, I what I always do, I just ignored him and put something together. Um, I've been doing this work for a long, long time, and so what I've titled this is What Works and What Doesn't in Reducing Recidivism, seven, le seven lessons I have learned over the years in evaluating correctional programs. Unlike my friend Steve Ost, who, who comes at it from a very broad policy perspective, cost-benefit analysis, I mean, it's fantastic work. We, we use his work often in, 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 in showing uh, examples of, of what you can do. My work's very different. I, I really, um, <clears throat> I never tried to change policy. I never got involved with things at that level. My work sometimes kind of forms the basis of that. But I've always set my goals much lower. It was to try to help folks that are running correctional programs be more effective. Uh, if I can go in and, and show them how to be more effective, train them on how to do that, I, I slept better at night. So I come at it from a little bit uh, a different approach. So what I want to do is talk about what these lessons are. The first lesson is that some things don't work. Uh, now you got, you got a little bit of, of, of a flavor of that from Steve and, and how they've gone about it. I learned that a number, a number of years ago, there was a county in my state that had a big drug problem. And they had a judge in that county, he was a very powerful judge, he wanted to do something about that drug problem. And so he uh, asked around, where could he find a good program for drug offenders? And somebody sent him down to Miami, and what better place to go for a drug program? And he went down to Miami and the judge down there said, I have just the program for you acupuncture. And he trotted out some poor indigents who said, acupuncture changed my life. And based on that anecdotal evidence, that judge came back to Ohio and created an acupuncture program run by the probation department. Because right? in Ohio, probation's under the court. It went something like this. They hired an a, a, a acupuncturist and they bought an old house down the street from the court and they turned it into a day reporting center. And offenders had to report every morning at 8.30. First thing they did was pee in a cup. Second thing they did was get acupuncture, five spots in the year. And then they spent the rest of the day in other activities, processing groups, education, 12-step groups, other things that don't work with offenders either, by the way. Right? 
And they did that for a long time. And uh, after a while, they called me up. I lived down the road, and they said, Ed, we want you to evaluate our program. We want to know if it's working or not. Let me be clear. When somebody asks me if a correctional program's working, I usually know what they're referring to. They want to know if it's reducing recidivism. It's a change in people's behavior. They're less likely to steal, use drugs, and hurt people, and all of those things that got them into trouble. Right? So I'm pretty clear about that. My job was to evaluate the program. That's not hard. They had a whole bunch of drug offenders that went to that program. They had a whole bunch of drug offenders that didn't go to that program. Right? So what's your hypothesis is simple. Does the treatment have an effect? Right? But then they wanted to know, did acupuncture work? Now I had a problem. Because everybody was in the program was getting acupuncture, but they were all getting all that other stuff. Think about it, right? Some of you work with a you test them, right? You give them counseling, you help them get a job, right? Give them good advice, can't give them enough of that good advice, right? And so if you're working with a group of offenders and they do well, is it because of the drug test? Is it because of the good advice? Because they got a job? You don't know, right? You just throw everything at them. You hope something sticks. That's what they were doing. But they want to know if acupuncture was working. To answer that question, I had to get them to allow me to do a random experiment. We randomly assigned offenders to one of three groups. Acupuncture. He'd come in in the morning, he'd pee in a cup, he'd get acupuncture, he'd get all that other good stuff. Placebo group. He'd come in in the morning, he'd pee in a cup, he'd get acupuncture in the wrong spot. That's okay. We'll give it to you for sexual dysfunction. <laughs> he got all that other good stuff. I knew you did. Yeah. Control group. Control group. She'd come in in the morning, she'd pee in a cup, she wouldn't get acupuncture, she'd get all the other stuff. Acupuncture, placebo, control. Acupuncture, placebo. That's how random assignment works. Make a long story short, what did we find? At the end of the study, who had the lowest recidivism rates? The control group. Now you ask why? Basically because acupuncture's horseshit. All right? but, but the question was, to me, why did they actually do worse? They didn't just not do better, they did worse than the treatment group. And I thought about this for a long time. And I think that those offenders that were in the acupuncture and placebo groups thought they were getting some treatment that was going to fix them. They could do what they always did, hang around with the same people, do the same things, think the same way. They were getting this, this new treatment. I'm telling you that story because not everything we do in the name of treatment is a fact. And that's how we build evidence. We do those kind of studies. Okay? Not everything works. These are some of the theories that I've come across. My staff and I have looked at over 600 programs now throughout the United States. I've been to more prisons than I care to remember. Halfway houses, day reporting, probation departments, sex offender, mental health, you name it. And these are some of the theories that we've come across. Okay? The, the offenders lack creativity theory. Okay? I remember seeing that once in California at a therapeutic community. And uh, they spent all day long in art therapy. And I remember saying to the director, why do you waste all your therapeutic time on art therapy? And she said, well, it, it reduces stress. And I said, you're right. You must have the most relaxed drug addicts in the state of California. <laughs> We've got offenders who need to get back to nature theory. You know, the problem is those kids live in, in Newark and Trenton. We need, to get them, we need to get them up into the woods, you know, some, some wilderness programs, teach them some survival skills so that when they escape from prison someday, they'll be able to make it, uh, by the way. Uh, <coughs> discipline and physical conditioning, of course, we saw that error with the boot camps. I've never understood why offenders in good shape. Okay? <laughs> What have you gotten out of the program? And he leaned in my face and he said, I'm in the best physical condition of my life, sir. And I thought, now I can run me down and kick my ass even quicker. Uh, this was a California one that uh, just changed their diet. Uh, Ah, uh, this was uh, Maine. Uh, this was a program where when the, when the men acted up, she'd, uh, the director made them wear a diaper and come to group in a diaper. It's a shaming technique. 
right? We're going to act like a baby. We're going to treat you like a baby. So ask how many of you like to be shamed and humiliated? Anybody? So what do you think you get when you shame and humiliate antisocial people, right? <clears throat> this was a mental health program in Ohio. We couldn't figure out what they were doing, and they just said, we just want them to be happy. So that's a happy, those are happy offenders. Uh, uh, male offenders need to get in touch with their feminine side theory. That's one of my favorite. That was actually a Jersey halfway house a number of years ago. And here's how it went. The theory is, you know, the reason us men are aggressive brutes, we're just not in touch with our feminine side. So what they did was they dressed them up as women. They had to go to group and drag. So uh, if you're ever mugged here in Jersey by an ugly guy in drag, it's probably one of the graduates. Just to show you I don't make this stuff up, uh, this is all what we call correctional quackery. Here's some examples. Uh, here's dance program gives juveniles moving on the right track. And, and then I'll, I'll read you what it says. It's kind of hard to read. There, in a small, secure, concrete area, young male offenders dance their way to a new outlook on life. So they're dancing their way out of criminal behavior. Running teaches inmates the value of success. I thought we didn't want them to run. Okay. <coughs> Drum circles, one of my favorites seen them actually many times, and they all, there's what they said. She introduced the first drum circle in a New Zealand prison and describes it as wow. That's the data they have right there, wow. Uh, the staff was amazed because most clients continued drumming for two hours without stopping to smoke. It doubles as a smoke sensation program. You can kill two birds with one stone with this one. Um, man's sentence was probation and yoga. That was for beating his wife, so we'll see how that works out. Uh, gardening conquers all, another one of my favorites, cut recidivism in half. I got a call once from a county, I want to know what they do. They started a garden program for offenders. I told them vegetables is what you'll get. Uh, I like this one. This is, out of, uh, this is out of Canada. Dog sledding is restorative max, uh, justice, and I like what they said. Exercising wilderness skills was a scene of way a way of rebuilding the perpetrator's self-esteem. So we got to make the, the perpetrator feel better about themselves. So they'll be even more narcissistic right, when they commit crime. Uh, handwriting formation therapy. And this is a new one, and I'm sad to say this is out of Cincinnati. This is the juvenile court. Circus clown trains troubled teens. So uh, they're not only getting in shape, they're losing, learning some tricks there. So I'm sure there's a big market for that. Um, Evidence-based practice, uh, people should understand there are different forms of evidence. The lowest form is anecdotal evidence. It's what most of us rely on. Right? Uh, someone thanks you for the work you've done with them, you feel good about that. You go to drug courts. I'm sure you have drug courts in New Jersey. Right? They have a graduation. They bring out all these folks that graduated. Every, it's, a, it's a moving experience. But that's anecdotal evidence. That's not the same as empirical evidence. And the center here that, that Rutgers is going to create is going to be about empirical evidence. At the end of the day, as Steve said, they're going to look at the data. Doesn't always make us feel good. People don't always get excited about the data. Sometimes it, it conflicts with what we, what we want it to say. Okay. But that's what evidence base is all about. All right, second lesson. Steve alluded to this. If you want to reduce recidivism, you focus on the offenders that are going to recidivate or likely to. That's the risk principle. There are different elements of the risk principle. But basically, if you think of it this way, if half the people that came out, come out of New Jersey's prisons never go back again, which half are you worried about? Uh, you're worried about the half that will. And so the risk principle, we saw it in, in 2002. We did what was then the largest study of community-based correctional treatment facilities, halfway houses, community-based correctional facilities. We have, now we have uh, 19 of them in Ohio. This was a study with about 13,000 uh, 13, offenders. Our director of corrections at the time was Reggie Wilkinson. Reggie basically said, you know, every year these folks come, they want more money, they claim they're doing great work. He said, we want to know how well they're doing. And so we did a study of all of those programs. What did we find? This is the treatment effect for low-risk offenders. The red bars are showing you how much worse low-risk offenders did were placed in those programs. Most of the programs increased failure rates 
for low-risk offenders. This is the treatment effect for high-risk offenders. Most of the programs reduce recidivism for high-risk offenders. Here you see the risk principle. If you take, just take this one, Mahoning County, 32% reduction in recidivism for high-risk, 29% increase for low-risk. That's important for uh, not only, obviously, public policy, but for researchers. We have to start looking at effects by risk. Because you can't get much effect when you that are at a 10% failure rate. It's the high risk that you want to target. We had eight programs in Ohio that did not reduce recidivism with anyone. Anyone know what the scientific term for that is? Shitty program. That's a scientific term for that. Uh, interesting lesson here in Ohio. This was the first time Ohio had ever done these kind of studies. And when the legislature asked the department, why are we continuing to fund these programs? The answer was, well, we've never looked at them before. We're going to give them, we're going to have action plans developed, we're going to have them work with, with, with experts, and we're going to study them again. And that's exactly what the state did. In 2010, we replicated the study, bigger study, 20,000 offenders. What did we find? Low risk. Most programs did not do well. High risk, most programs reduce recidivism. And I'd like to point out, all of these programs had at least 50% reductions for high risk offenders. These programs are no longer in business in Ohio. Ohio has canceled their contracts, given them out to new folks, uh, and decided they, weren't, they, they couldn't justify 10 years of data saying programs that were, were not working should continue to get money. So Ohio took a very hard line on it, but uh, I, I think it was the only choice they had. Overall, low risk, reduced recidiv increased recidivism 3%, high risk overall, we reduced it by 14%. And you say 14%, well, you know, it's not that good. Well, there are 20,000 offenders in this study. You start looking at across a state like New Jersey, you can reduce recidivism rates 15, 20 percent for that group. You're doing something. All right. We have seen the risk principle, by the way, with females, negative effects when you put low risk females into these intensive programs, treatment effects when you target high risk. We've seen the risk principle with sex offenders, negative effects when you put high risk and low-risk sex offenders in the same program. Okay. You think about that. That makes a lot of sense. Treatment effects when you target high-risk sex offenders. The third lesson, and it's really an extension of the risk principle, is sometimes we fail because we don't provide enough treatment. And I started thinking about this uh, a few years ago. And it's really, uh, you think about it, it's a dosage issue. Okay. How much treatment does someone need to get the effect? And I was thinking about it in relation to the medical field. Right? If, if, you, if you have an infection, you go to the doctor, sometimes you get a prescription, and, and the doctor will say to you, take them all even if you're feeling better, because this is a tough, tough infection to kill. Right? And if you're like me, you save a few for when you're sick again. Right? I got a whole medicine cabinet of pills, I don't know what the hell they are. But, um, and then, in my own life, I, got, I had to go through a regimen of chemotherapy and radiation. And it was very clear that, that there was a very prescribed dosage. If I couldn't complete those radiation treatments, it might not kill the cancer. If they gave me too much, it might kill me. And so it was a very prescribed dosage treatment. And, and so I started thinking about this issue. Right? Most studies, and the question becomes, what does intensive mean? We talk about that all the time. Give them more treatment. Make it more intense, right? In probation, it means see them more. Well, we know from research that isn't going to get you very far. Most studies show the longer someone's in treatment, the greater the effects. You look at studies, substance abuse, mental health, all the studies, right? You keep people in treatment, and they do better. The problem is, there, there, there becomes a point of diminishing return. If you keep them too long, effects start to go down. And, and I think that's simply because people give up. 
If I keep you in, in a treatment too long, eventually you're just going to say, hey, I, I can't keep doing this. So <coughs> we're just starting to see uh, oh, your thing doesn't work here. Oh. I don't know, but I will replace it. Huh? Hey, me. Um, don't worry, I'm prepared. We're, we're just starting this research in corrections, examining the, the effect of dosage and, and, and effects. Let me put a new one. Killing me here. Okay. Um, a few years ago, all right, I think it's working. A few years ago, the Canadians did a study of an incarcerated prison population, and they looked at the, the effect of dosage. They had three variations in cognitive behavioral treatment 100, 200, 300 hours. Basically, what they found was 100 hours of, of, of structured, based groups had an effect for moderate risk offenders. It had no effect on high risk offenders. For high risk offenders, you had to dramatically increase the dosage of treatment to get an effect. For the very high risk, they, they topped out at 300 hours. So I started thinking about this. So we did a study, <coughs> about to be published, looking at a 100 bed secure residential facility. So this is more of a halfway house type of facility. This is in the community. These are men that are sent there for four or five months, given a range of treatment. They look like most other offenders or substance abusers. They're high risk and so forth. What did we find? Increasing dosage for moderate risk offenders only produced a modest effect in, in, in treatment. But increasing the treatment for high risk offenders dramatically reduce the recidivism rates. So, of course, what's it mean? We can't have one size fits all programs. I've been to hundreds of programs, and that's one of the biggest things we see. Okay. The truth is, we talk about individualized treatment, we talk about this, but the reality is these men and women come in and they pretty much get, at, get the same thing. And so we have to start thinking different about not only how do we measure dosage, but how do we apply it. Lesson number four is um, everybody thinks they're an expert in criminal behavior. And I don't mean you. Most of you are experts. You deal with this all the time. But I think there's a couple reasons we go wrong here. One is our training. Sometimes our training inhibits our, our ability to see what's driving criminal behavior. I'll give you an example. If you're trained in substance abuse, what are you looking for? When you sit down with that offender, what are you looking for? Substance abuse. If you're trained in mental health, what are you looking for? Mental health, right? I mean, read, read a psychiatrist's report on any offender. They talk about mood disorders, depression, anxiety. It has very little to do with criminal conduct. But yet, that's what they're focused on. The other reason, I think, is... is Quite frankly, everybody has an opinion about criminal behavior. Okay. Think, uh, how, those of you that work with offenders, do your family and friends tell you what you should be doing to straighten these folks out? I will bet they do. Right? I get it all the time. I was on a flight once. I was flying to Boise, and I was sitting at, next to some elderly woman. She was one of these chatty types, you know, wouldn't take a hint. And uh, asked me what I did for a living. I made the mistake of telling her. Um, for four hours, she told me how to solve the crime problem. Now I just tell them I'm a proctologist. They leave me alone. Uh, <coughs> Ruth by Andrew, Jean Drow, and others have identified some major risk need factors. Attitudes, values, beliefs, cognitive emotional states. 
rage, anger, identity. If you see yourself as a thug, you're going to act like a thug. How you see the world, how you see your behavior. I interviewed a parolee the other day, and I said, are you working? He said, no, I quit my job. I said, why? He said, I wasn't getting enough hours. I said, how many are you getting now? He said, none. I said, you're moving backwards, right? Most of us don't quit our jobs, so we have another job lined up. Not him. He showed them. Money to zero. It's that kind of short-term thinking, not thinking through the consequences that often get them into trouble. Pro-criminal associates, you don't know this. Your mothers knew it. If you're a parent, you knew it. You worry about who your kids hang around with. But it's not just having bad friends. It's not having pro-social people in your life. When you work with offenders, you need to strategize on how you start connecting them with the pro-social people they know, their family, employers, teachers, folks like that. Because a lot of them try to isolate themselves. They'll say, well, I'm not hanging around with that crap. But, but that, that's a limited strategy, because eventually they're going to go hang around with folks again. Most of us are social animals. We're not social isolates. And so we've got to work harder at that. Temperament and antisocial personality factors, weak socialization, impulsivity, adventurous, restlessly aggressive, egocentrism. That's basically the opposite of low self-esteem. Give me low self-esteem any day. It can be a barrier. It's not a big risk factor. I remember years ago we were uh, assessing kids. Ohio was uh, testing a new assessment instrument. And so my staff, we went up to uh, our reception center and we started assessing kids coming into the prison system, into, into the juvenile system. Now I want you to think about this for a minute. These were 15, 16 year olds mostly. Most of these kids had never been away from home in their life. And they're in an institution. Some of them are going to be there for a long time. So think about how your kids might feel, or, or you might have felt at that age. So we had a question we asked those kids on a coolness scale. With one being not cool at all and ten being really cool, how cool do you see yourself? The kids that came out high risk, you know what their typical answer was? Eleven and a half, baby, I'm off the charts. Okay. They're in an institution, but that was their self-image. That's how they saw themselves. And of course, weak problem solving and self-regulation and coping skills. And of course, a history of antisocial behavior. Also on the list, family factors that include criminality. It's a risk factor, but you can't change it. The person sitting in front of you's father was in prison or mother. It helps explain why they're there, but it does really nothing you can target. But you can target things like, like, like levels of affection, caring, and cohesiveness in the family. For kids, poor parental supervision and discipline and outright neglect and abuse. Low levels of educational, vocational, or financial achievement. And that's the key word there. It's not about get them a job. It's about how they view work. It's about working hard to get ahead going to the next level, supporting your family. You have to work on those attitudes about work. I'm going to show you a study in a minute. Low levels in pro-social leisure activities, and of course, substance abuse. There are other risk factors, but these are the major ones. This is a recent study done in Pennsylvania looking at parole revocation. The folks that, they're like Jersey. They're a traditional parole state. Most people come out of prison or get paroled. And, and so they looked at who failed and who succeeded. What did they find? Failures, more likely to hang around with individuals with criminal backgrounds, less likely to live with a spouse, less likely to be in a stable, supportive relationship, less likely to identify someone in their life who served in the mentoring capacity. Employment and financial, only slightly more likely to report having difficulty getting a job. They were less likely to have job stability, less likely to be satisfied with employment, less likely to take low-end jobs and work their way up, more likely to have negative attitudes toward employment, less likely to have a bank account, more likely to report they were barely making it, yet the, yet the success group had double the median debt. Again, it wasn't about getting a job, it's about working a job, it's about how they viewed work. Alcohol use, drug use, they, they were more likely to report use of alcohol 
happens on parole, but no difference in prior assessment of dependency. The difference was the ones that failed didn't have coping skills. When they got out and they got into situations they couldn't handle, we can work on that. Those are things we can practice and rehearse with the before they get when they're in halfway houses. Of course, lots of criminal attitudes, <coughs> poor problem solving, coping skills, didn't anticipate long term consequences, acted impulsively, shifted blame. So we see, again, these attitudes, values, personality traits shining through as risk factors. What didn't predict? Well, finding a job or finding a place to live. Important, human needs. We all need a place to live. But it did not distinguish the failures from the successes. So you think about reentry, and you think about our reentry efforts. I always tell folks, you know, I go to a lot of reentry programs, and, and I categorize them as they want to help people. That's great. But if you want to reduce recidivism, you need to pay attention to the research, because there's a difference. Lesson five. Offenders are not usually higher risk because they have a risk factor. They have multiple risk factors. And, and what this really speaks to is the need to design multimodality programs rather than these kind of silo programs that we often have. I'm using this as an example. This is the LSIR. This is, this is an assessment tool. And it happens to be a, a, an offender that was assessed with the LSI. And I'm pointing out for a reason. If you look at this offender, high in criminal history, very high in companions, very high in, or high in substance abuse, high in emotional and personal, and high in attitudes and orientations. Happens to be a woman. Okay. If you put her in a drug program, cleaned her up, how far do you think you'd get? Reducing her recidivism. Well, might maybe, but look at it. She's clicking on a whole bunch of others there. Her friends are going to up in the parking lot, by the way, and they'll probably be high before they hit the freeway. <laughs> so you ha we have to look at programming differently. This is a study that was done here in New Jersey, uh, folks at Rutgers. They looked at 412 adult offenders with mental illness incarcerated, both male and female. Basically, let me tell you what they found. The, the, the mentally diagnosed offenders scored higher in criminal attitudes and values than the non-mentally disordered offenders. What did they say? Criminal thinking styles differentiate people who commit crime from those who do not. M many incarcerated persons with mental illness are both mentally ill and criminal need to be treated as co-occurring problems. Again, what it shows us is it's, they're, they're not in prison just because they're mentally ill. They have other criminal genetic needs that have to be addressed. This is a chart from analysis. Steve referred to it briefly. And basically, it's confirming this. Programs that target multiple criminal genetic areas are much more effective than ones that don't. And again, I'll take a simple one. I'll take employment. Take employment as a, as a risk factor. For a parolee here in New Jersey, a probationer, being unemployed a risk factor, you think? Absolutely. Absolutely. Is it one for you? So you'd start selling drugs? My old ladies? Stealing cars if you lost your job? No. What would most of us do? We go find another job. Most of us would find another job if we were unemployed. But if you said things like, I can make more money in a day than you make in a month, if you said things like, I'm not working for 10 bucks an hour, if you said, I'm not into that 9 to 5 thing, somebody said to me, I'm doing all right, now you're much more higher risk because you have all those antisocial attributes and you got 40 hours a week to get into trouble. But just being unemployed doesn't make most of us high risk for criminal behavior. So understand the context as you look at your programs here in Jersey. And you're fortunate here in the state. You've reduced your prison population. You've got a lot of providers out there doing multi-modality programs. So you've got the infrastructure now. Now you've got to focus on some different things, eh? Like quality. This is one of the lessons I've learned, Steve alluded to it, is doing things well make a difference. That's true in almost everything in life. This is out of Washington State's research. 
What did they find for uh, evidence-based programs for youthful offenders? Functional family therapy, aggression replacement therapy, both reduced recidivism, but only if they were competently delivered. We just finished a study in Ohio, and we found not doing a COG group poorly was worse than not doing it at all. We found the same thing with domestic violence groups. Doing it poorly was worse than not doing it at all. So, <coughs> several major studies we've done, it, and, and uh, committed to come in and, and work with uh, uh, Rutgers and, and all and help them on the processes we use to assess programs. Over the years, I've done some very large studies that looked at the relationship between program integrity and outcome. In other words, if you've got a, a program that's well-designed, well-run, targeting the right risk factors, putting the right people in it, folks are running the groups with fidelity, okay, that has an effect on recidivism. Poor quality residential programs increased recidivism in Ohio 19% on average. High quality reduced recidivism 22% on average. That's a 40% swing right there. If you didn't break out the data that way, it, would, might, 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 it might look like no effect. Community supervision programs, poorly designed, poorly implemented, increased recidivism. High quality, reduced recidivism. Juvenile programs, for every risk level of juvenile, whether they were prevention programs or deep end programs, the higher the quality program, the lower the recidivism rates. So we've consistently seen this in our data. Lesson seven is we can change their behavior, we just have to go about it the right way. And, and let me say it's not an easy thing to do. If you think it's easy to change behavior, try changing your own. Okay. It's not easy. It's not easy. You try to lose weight or give up a bad habit. It, it's a tough thing to do. But I, I'm, and I actually learned this from this crew. These are my four children. Okay. They're all adult children now. But I, I learned it from them, starting with this one. <laughs> this is the baby. This is Allison. And when Allison was little, she would get in a lot of trouble. She had quite a temper on her. And uh, it was particularly directed at her brother. Her brother, Michael. This is Michael. Good-looking boy, isn't he? Huh? Yeah, good-looking boy. Uh, Michael, um, one day, he did something to her. I don't know what it was. She was about four or five or six. I don't remember. But she threw the portable phone and bounced it off his head. And, of course, he's wailing and crying, and she's standing over him because she's really going to give it to him now. And I catch her. I catch her. I said, that's it, Allison. How many times have I told you not to hit your brother? She said, I don't know. I thought you were keeping town. I said, <laughs> Get in the corner. Get in the corner, right? I put her in the corner. What's going on here? Well, she's in the cognitive emotional state of rage. That's what she's in. I'm punishing her. I'm punishing her to extinguish the behavior. That's the purpose of the punishment, right? To extinguish the behavior. So I tell her, you stand in the corner. You know, she's turning around, looking at me, looking at her brother, and she's thinking, when I'm done with him, I'm coming after you. And I'm like, get that nose back in the corner, right? So how long? The first, thought, the first thing I have to decide is how long do I punish her, right? I'm the legislature here. I have to decide that. So she's five, five minutes, a right? minute for every year. First two minutes, she's still madder than hell, spitting and looking, right? Minute, minute four, she's pouting. You know, big lip comes out. You know, I wish I was dead. That would fix you, you know? About minute five, she said, Dad, I'm ready to get out of the corner. I said, well, the timer hasn't gone off yet. I want you to think about what you did. Right? Now, the anger's gone. The black cloud's gone. She's reasonable. The punishment has worked to the extent that it extinguished the behavior. Problem is, I haven't replaced it. Punishment doesn't teach you what to do. It just teaches you what not to do. Timer goes off. I bring her out of the corner. I said, sit down, Allison. I said, I want to talk to you about what happened. Tell me what happened. She said, Michael did this. I said, that's criminal thinking. She looked at me funny. I said, I'm not asking what Michael did. She's going to blame the victim right away, right? 
I want to know what you did. She said, well, I hit him with the phone. Now, the question is this. Do you think when she hit him with the phone, do you think it made her feel good? Yeah, it made her feel good. She get caught all the time? No, she don't. She get caught maybe one out of ten times, right? So, she, she, and she know what she's thinking? I'll do my five minutes in the corner. <laughs> huh? Now, she's little, she's not, but that's what she's thinking. I'll take my punishment. It was worth it. I showed him he can't push me around like that. Right? She actually get a lot of reinforcement from that behavior, by the way, just like offenders do. Right? You go into a bar and somebody spills a drink or you spill a drink on somebody, what do you do? You hit them on the head with a beer bottle? No. You apologize. You buy them a drink. You, I mean, because you have a lot of ways to handle that situation. What do offenders do? Somebody's getting ass whooped. And even if they go to jail, they got a story to tell. A lot of reinforcement from that behavior. Allison's standing there, and I say, Allison, <coughs> I said, do you like getting in trouble? No, I don't like getting in trouble. I said, how about if I could show you a way to deal with Michael where you wouldn't get in trouble? She said, you can do that? I said, I can do that, but you've got to make me two promises, only two. One, you'll try it, and two, you'll come and tell me how it worked. It's the only commitment I want. She said, all right, I think I can do that. So I said, all right, show me what Michael did. And she showed me what Michael did. And I said, well, okay, here's how to handle that. And we practiced it. But I knew Michael. And I knew Michael wasn't going to give up easy. So I said, what if Michael comes at you like this? She said, oh, I really let him have it. I said, no, 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 let me show you how to deal with that. And we practiced it, and we rehearsed her what? Her risky situation. And I said, remember our promise. So sure enough, you know, a week later, Michael did something. She did what I told her. She came and she said, Dad, you should have seen the look on his face. I did exactly. I said, I'm so proud of you, sweetie. I'm going to get you some ice cream. First, I got to go straighten his ass out. Okay? <laughs> My point is, the mistake I was making, because I'd say to her, don't you do that. You come get me and your mother. We'll take care of it, right? And, and, and so when I said to her, what are you supposed to do? She looked at me and said, come get you and mom. She knew the words, but she didn't know the music. I interview offenders all the time coming out of prison. And I ask them. I always ask them, tell me what you're playing. They'll go, I'm not coming back here. I hate this place. You know, I'm never coming back. And I'll say, well, all right, so when you get into this situation, because you got into it eight times before here, I see, how are you going to hit And look at me. And they'll go, well, I'm not getting into that situation again. My friends aren't going to come over. They know. I'm like, well, how do they know? Is it on the Internet? And what it tells me immediately is there's been no risk plan, there's been no practice, there's been no skill development. Cognitively, they don't want to come back. They get that. People don't like prison. It's a bad place. But they don't know what to do when they get into those situations. And so the mistake I was making with Allison was I was yelling at her. I told her, don't do it. She knew what the, she's not stupid. She heard me say it 50 times. But when she got in this situation, she did what she always did. Because it worked for her. And most of the time it did work. So, learn that from them. That using behavioral approaches, structured social learning. I'm going to show you, how am I doing? I, I got enough time. I'm a little late. Uh, structured social learning. And, and by the way, social learning is not a theory of criminal behavior, it's a theory of human behavior. It's how we learn our attitudes, our values, our behavior. It's from others around us. It's reinforced. It's practiced. It's a, it's a very complex process. Not a complex concept. It's an easy concept. How many of you have children? How many of you turned into your parents when you had children? You woke up one day, you're your mother. It's the last person you're going to be at 15. I have four. I always said once, when she's a parent, she's going to let her kids do whatever they want. I said, that, that's okay. You just be home at 10 o'clock. But I say things I swore I'd never say. You're born in a barn, think money grows on trees. I'll give you something to cry about. That was all my favorite one, right? I said to my son Michael once, I said, Michael, do I look like Rockefeller? He said, who the hell is this Rockefeller guy? And I said, I'm sorry. Do I look like Bill Gates? Eh? Focus on risk factors. One of the attributes of behavioral programming is it doesn't focus on the past. I can't change the past. Sometimes the past is a barrier. 
And the extent I have to remove it. But it's about the here and now. Fenders get in trouble because they're, they're, they're not working. They're, they're not taking care of their family. They're using drugs. They're hanging around with the wrong people. Those are current risk factors. It's action oriented, not talk oriented. They're not going to change. You think they're offenders because they never got any good advice. Oh, no, they never got any good advice from you. That's why they're offenders. It's teaching them new skills, new ways to behave. And, of course, appropriate reinforcement. This study just came out looking at intensive supervision. Steve showed you the effects of intensive supervision with no treatment. That research has been around for years. Let's see. You lower caseloads, you see them more, you drug test them more, and you're surprised when you catch them more. I always tell them, so a guy couldn't report once a month, you make him report three times. My, my, I tell my wife, we have a caseload of two. We got four kids, two each. They still do shit we don't want them to do. Okay. So we know in a long time. But look what they found here. This was a study that said, look, rewards the punishment. Most of that research, I always talk about you need four to one, so forth, that comes out of psychology. But here's a study of a criminal justice population, intensive supervision. This is their probability of success. And look at, as they started to increase rewards to punishers, dramatic increase in success rate. Dramatic. So we have to do a better job of factoring in rewards. We're currently testing the new model, and, and, and I'm going to show you a clip from it. It only takes a few minutes. Uh, and I'm showing you this clip because for years I struggled. I knew how to go into a correctional facility and work with them on, on social learning models and costs, right? We, we, we redesigned a behavioral management system. We trained the staff. I, I knew how to do that. I didn't really know how to do it with probation officers and parole officers and case managers, right? And, and, and so this whole idea is how do we take the people that are most involved with offenders, because they're, they're all probation or parole at some point or working with case managers, and teach them how to use this model more effectively. <coughs> we structure the sessions, and I'm not going to go into details, but I want you to see how this comes together. All right? Here's some data from Canada. Uh, they're seeing reductions, uh, increases in retention rate, uh, reductions in recidivism. Federal probation is using the model. Uh, Chris Long Camp's one of my former students, and he's been training them, and they're starting to see reductions in recidivism. But I want you to see, uh, this is a fairly short clip. I'll just give you a little background. This is an offender who just got out of a correctional facility. Okay. Will be equivalent to one of, your, one of your similar kind of facilities. He was there four to six months. He went through a lot of treatment. He's now out. He's under supervision. He runs into a problem, okay. makes a bad decision. Not fatal. And now he's meeting with his probation officer who's trying, is going to use this model to work with this offender. This is called a skill building session. There are different sessions based on what the problems are, where the offenders are. But, but the whole session takes 13 minutes. I want you to see it. Uh, I think it, it says it better than I could uh, in, in explaining. Good morning. Thank you for coming in today, Charles. I really I also want to say thank you for being on time. I know that every time you come in, you're on time, and I just want to let you know that really helps our day go well here because we have clients like your clients, and it's nice to see you here. It's nice to see you on time. That's how to do it, I can. Thank you. I want to just check in with you a little bit since our last session, see if there's anything new that's going on. Yeah, this is a little something about the, um, the homework that I, that I have done for you. Okay. Before. Well, let's, let's hang on that. Let me check with a few other things, and then we'll get right into that homework. Mm -hmm. Any problems at work? No, everything's splendid right there. Everything's splendid there? That's uh, good to hear. I'm, I'm glad I'm working. Good, I bet you are. What about family? Everything's cool. Mom, mom, mom's okay. Father's okay. Okay, that's good. Any problems with drugs or alcohol since the last visit? Nah, not actually. Okay, okay. And you're working, so I'm sure you're paying your fines and taking care of all that business. Oh, yeah, I just made the job all right now. Excellent. All right, very good. So let's talk about that homework a little bit here. There you go. Let's see. 
You definitely have a situation to talk about, huh? Yeah, it was, it was stressful. Why don't you tell me a little bit about the external piece, the situation? Well, it was, um, since I've been out, I really ain't seen too many of my friends lately. Mm -hmm. So one of them all of a sudden just popped up. I don't know how he found out I was out because I ain't calling him nothing. Where did you see him at? He came to my house. Oh, so he knocked on the door. Yeah. That definitely goes against your plan to avoid everyone, huh? Mm -hmm. You tell me what you were thinking when he knocked on the door. Well, I'm thinking, I'm like, I'm like, how did, how did he know I was even out? That's what I was thinking at first, because I was the people. I'm like, how do you know I was even home? I'm like, he always peer pressure me too. I don't, I don't, I don't like this friend right here for real, because he always trying to peer pressure me to do something. Even though I told him that I ain't, I'm not doing that addictive behavior anymore, so. So you were thinking, what am I going to do? Yeah. Yeah, so what choice did you make? I opened the door and hollered at him. We had a nice little conversation talking about the old days. So he done peer pressure me once again, and I done went to the bar. It was smoke everywhere. He tried to give me a drink, but I didn't drink, but it was still a, a crazy situation that I really didn't want to be in. Yeah. Sounds like you did well by not drinking, but you also put yourself at risk at by going to the bar with him. Mm -hmm. I was smoking around, probably could have got in my system. So I got a dirty pee, you know, I just told you what. some of the old days, good times we had. So I figured going to the bar wouldn't even want to be too bad as long as I don't smoke or drink, even though it could be a trigger. So those memories, those thoughts of the old days were kind of some powerful reasons why you decided to go to the bar. You mm -hmm. still didn't want to get in trouble, so it sounds like you were trying to manage the situation. Yes. Since you couldn't avoid it since he was right there. Yes, um, hopefully that urine comes back clean. You said you didn't smoke, you didn't drink, so that is good news. But you know, this isn't going to be the last time that he probably comes knocking on the door, is it? No. No. So what are we? He said he'll call me in a couple days. Uh oh. I have to change my number. So you already know he plans on trying to hang out with you again. Mm -hmm. So what? What I want to maybe talk with you about today is what we can do when he calls back, or maybe someone else shows up on the porch, or kind of, you know, some other high risk situations from your friends that might just kind of fall into place like this one did. Mm -hmm. And we can talk a little bit about what you can do in those situations. Okay. Would you be willing to talk about that? Sure. Okay. What I have is one of the skills that maybe you learned in River City or you know, kind of like those skills, I should say, that you learned in River City with the active listening, giving mm -hmm. feedback. There's a skill that falls into dealing with friends called avoiding trouble with others. And I'd like to just talk a little bit about, you know, how you can use that skill to maybe help deal with situations like this so that you don't end up at the bar because, you know, this time you made a good choice once you got to the bar, but what if we can backtrack and avoid the bar altogether? Mm -hmm. So when you think about avoiding friends that can get you into trouble or avoiding trouble with your friends, what might be one of the first decisions that you have to make? First is telling that I, I'm not doing that no more, basically. Just so before you even tell them, Sounds like to me you need to decide if being with him or doing that thing could get you into trouble. Right. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. So you need to first make a decision, hey, this could get me into trouble? Yeah. Would you mind writing that down so we can kind of keep a step-by-step -step process of how to do that? So once you decide if this could get you into trouble, the next question is, I know it can get me into trouble, or it might not get me into trouble, but do I want to avoid it? Because it sounds to me like in that situation when your buddy showed up at the door, you recognize, oh man, here we go again. Mm -hmm. You know, I know this can't work out or for the good, but yet, what happened? I still went with him. Still went with him. So we need something in there to decide, do I really want to make a different choice? Do I want to get out of this situation? So you think we could try that after that first step? Yeah, who's right? Okay, so let's maybe say, you know, is this a situation that can get me into trouble? And then next step, do I want to get out of this situation? Decide that. So 
And then if you make the choice, I don't want to go to the bar, I don't want to get into trouble. Do you think it's important to tell that other person that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So would that think do you think that'd be the next logical step? Tell that other person what you decided? Yes. Okay. And then sometimes people like to hear other suggestions. I mean maybe you do want to hang out with your buddy. But is the bar the best place to hang out? No, I just gotta tell them wherever we go do it ain't no drugs and alcohol bar. Okay. So maybe a safer place. Could you make some different suggestions to where those safe places might be? It could be my house for real, because my mother don't allow smoking in the house, so okay. she's a church woman, so that really would be disrespectful to do that in there. Sounds like it. Well then that would be one definite suggestion too. What if he doesn't want to hang out at your house though? Um we could probably go out to eat or something. I'd like to teach you Friday long or something. I didn't lock the no, no smoking session. What about the alcohol, sir? Oh, okay. I ain't thinking about the alcohol because I really ain't never drunk alcohol in no restaurants. That's okay. Just something to think about. When you think about the other suggestions, you want to make sure that they're going to help you meet your goal of not getting into trouble. <laughs> mm -hmm. Let's see what we do. I never really thought about it like that for real. I had to get some thoughts on it. Well, for now, you have your house. He can come in and you guys can hang out there. But if he still says, no, man, I don't want to hang out at your house. I want to go to the bar. And he's really pressuring you. If you're going to avoid trouble with him, what's the bottom line? Bottom line is that I not even deal with him. Then you need to not go, right? You need to tell him, look, then you go to the bar. I'm going to stay here at my house. Mm -hmm. So kind of the last step is, if, even if he doesn't take your suggestion, whatever it may be, you need to kind of stand your ground and do what's best for you. Right. So if that means staying at home and letting him go, that might mean staying at home and letting him go. So you think the last step could be doing what's best for myself? Yes, that got to be. that got to be because I can't afford to go back to jail. Yeah, something to keep in the back of your mind there as you're going through these steps. Okay, so we've got some steps down here now. Any questions on those steps? Um, actually, that, that really helped me out. Okay, so do you think it would help even more if I maybe role play? If I could maybe show you what those steps would look like? Yeah, and then maybe you sure can that. give it a try yourself? Yeah, we'll try that. Okay, so how about I play Charles? I'll play you, and you play your buddy. Okay. Okay, and you're trying to talk me into coming out and hanging out at the bar, and I'll use these steps to get out of the situation. And you took thinking for a change, right? Yes. Did you use this to kind of identify when you're thinking? Yes. Do you mind if I do that to kind of help show you the steps? Yes. Okay. All right. So why don't you start it off by knocking on the door? Knock, knock. Oh, man, here we go. I know he ain't to show up on my doorstep like that. I've been telling him I've changed. Oh, this is, he could get me into so much trouble. I just, I don't know what to do. I, I, I obviously want to open the door. He's a childhood buddy of mine, but... I know this situation is going to get me in trouble. I know i got to get out of this situation. I think I'm just going to tell him that, you know, it's great to see him. He's more than welcome to come in and hang out. But if he tries to fool anything, asking me to go anywhere, I just can't do it. Hey, man, how's it going? What's up, man? Why you ain't telling me he was out? I'm you know, just trying to keep it straight and narrow this time, trying to do what i got to do. You know what time it is. It's time to go to the bar, man. You ready? You know, I, I'm more than happy to hang out with you. Why don't you come on in? We can just chill here. Well, we can go chill at the bar. You're right. We can we chill can't at the bar. can do nothing in your house. You're right. We can chill at the bar. But, you know, I'm trying to keep it together. So I'm going to be hanging out here. I'd love to hang out and catch up with you if you want to come on in. But I can't go to the bar. Oh, you're going to do me like that all these years. <laughs> it is what it is, bro. I'm sorry. All right. I'm going to call you tomorrow. Man. I got something to talk to you about. All right. All right. So what do you think? That was excellent. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> so, you think you can give it a try? Mm -hmm. Same situation, but you walk through the steps this time? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So, I'll come knocking on your door. I'll be your friend. And this time, you have to kind of go through your thoughts and figure out what the best thing to do is. You can make the suggestion hanging out inside. Mm -hmm. And then, remember, just to do what's best for you. Mm -hmm. What do you think, though? Oh, here he go. Oh, what he, what is he doing? I didn't know I was out. I've been trying to change now. He's trying to come peer pressure me. 
I already know what he about to do. I can't get in trouble right now. I'm on probation. I got too much at stake right now. And I got a good job on. I got to tell him no, because that, that ain't the way to go no more. I got to do what's best for me anyway. What's up, bro? Hey, where you been? Yeah, I've been working. Working? Yeah. Oh, you haven't called, you haven't seen him. We haven't celebrated you being out. I can't do that no more. You can't do that. Bars right around the corner, everybody's there. Let's have them up there. That's too much of behavior. I can't be around anymore. So, what you want to do? You going to leave me hanging? Nah, I ain't going to leave you hanging. We can chill in my house or something better than that. I got to go to work in the morning. Chill at your house? Yeah, that's about it right now. I got to watch my nephew anyway. Alright, I'm alright with that. Okay. See you in a minute. Right. So, what do you think? I think that's, that's really worked out pretty well. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Would you be able to try it outside of our office here in the session we just had? Mm -hmm. yeah. well, what if, I know we have to meet again next week. I think we're meeting next Thursday again at 1 o'clock. So if we're going to meet again next Thursday, do you think you might have an opportunity to try that from now until then? Oh, yeah, because he, he must rather go probably come to my house once again. All right. Well, why don't you give that a try? And once he does that, give me a call. Okay. I know we're going to meet Thursday, but give me a call and let me know between then how it went. And then in, just in case it pops up again before we meet, we can kind of problem solve on the spot. Okay. That's fine. All right. Thanks. Good to see you again. You too. <laughs> Well, listen, I've already taken enough time. I did want to try to show that because this is really the kind of work now that, that uh, we've been doing at the university that I hope we can get and partner up with Rutgers on, really trying to move the field forward. We're trying to do what we know from the research, from the evidence, and applying it. And, and that means teaching folks how to do it and, and helping them get there. It means collecting data. It, we, have, uh, we have five pilot sites with this model where we're randomly assigning officers to use it. We have a control group. Uh, I didn't tell you that when they do it, they have to audio tape every session. And they, they email them to us. And we code them. We listen to them. And, we, and so we're, as part of the research, we're giving them feedback. And we're trying to see where they're, where they're doing it well and where they're not. It's all part of trying to, I think, become more effective. So, I'm going to end now, and I know Todd has some questions, and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thanks. Um, so uh, I have some questions here. Um, first question is about size of programs, large programs versus small programs. Is there a, is there a difference? Um, in, in their ability to integrate basic principles into what they're working on. I'll just talk at the adult level. Uh, in our last study of halfway houses, uh, we actually did look at size. And surprisingly, the bigger, the larger programs were more effective. Uh, we believe it's because they had more resources. They could do more programming. They could divide offenders into groups by risk. They could address responsivity. I don't think size is as important as how well you do things. If you're bringing 100 people in a room and you're lecturing to them, I don't care if you're bringing 100 people in a room or 10 people in a room and lecturing to them, it's not going to be very effective. You've got to figure out how to take a big program and make it small. And that means everybody in that program gets a chance to practice, to work on their risky situation. So I don't think size is, is that important. Now, in the juvenile world, that's a little different. There is some research that says that smaller community-based programming definitely shows better effects than large facilities. Uh, so, so I think that there's more research on the juvenile end than the adult yet. But, but I, I, I don't see size as a critical, as a critical element. Um, so, somebody seems to know that you've got new legislation in Ohio about the version of nonviolent offenders in the community corrections program. Can you tell us a little bit about that research and then talk about what you think it's going to do in Ohio? Yeah. Um, Ohio recently went through the justice reinvestment process that the Council of State Governments uh, has been, and Pew Institute have been involved with, uh, came in, looked at our data, and, and really helped Ohio craft some legislation. 
Uh, a lot of that was based on our work at the University of Cincinnati. And so, for example, under the new legislation, every offender has to be assessed with a valid, uh, objective uh, instrument. Uh, so that's in the legislation now. Certain levels of offenders can't be placed in certain programs. The halfway houses and the CBCFs can no longer serve low-risk offenders by legislation. And so there were a number of changes. Um, I think the effects are going to be that uh, we are going to move more and more low-risk people out of our prison into the community. Uh, we've got to make sure we have the programs there to, to support that. But I think overall, it's very good legislation. Uh, our goal is to try to reduce our prison population by at least 5,000. We have 51,000 people in prison, so we're a very large, uh, a large system. Um, and, and I think the legislation is going to help us do that. So uh, I was a supporter of it. Uh, and and uh, I think at the end, you know, obviously, there's always compromises, but I think it was the right thing to do. Talk about what you think the public safety implications and then, and then link that to the work that the University of Cincinnati does. Yeah, well, obviously, you know, as Steve said, you can't just, you know, you, if you just let everybody out and, and you don't have the program there to support them, you're going to see an increase in the crime rate. So I think there are concerns, obviously, about public safety. It's always about public safety. Ohio has a lot of programs, and with justice reinvestment, it's, it's what the name entails. Ohio is going to make available to the counties, we have a county-based system, um, uh, monies to create evidence-based programs. And so there's, there's, a, there's a process in place to make sure. The University of Cincinnati is playing a big role in that. We, we are currently redesigning uh, nine halfway houses in Ohio and six CBCF. So when I say redesign, these were all programs that were not effective. I should say they were they were graded out as on the margin, and so we've gone in. My staff have gone in. We are training their staff. We are coaching their staff. We have implemented. We have given them new curriculum. We have helped them. We what you saw with ethics is really what we call core correctional practices. We believe those practices should be done whether somebody's in prison or in a halfway house or on probation, and so. We happen to apply it here to somebody on probation, but we believe that those practices should be done regardless of the setting. And so we're redesigning programs around the state of Ohio. So our work's really changed. When, when I first started doing this work, it was mostly research. And then we started going out and looking at programs. And then, we, then when folks said, well, OK, can you help us? We started to develop tools. We started to develop training. So we've really evolved. Most of my work now is, is, is spent on, on these redesigns and on uh, developing new techniques and new products. So uh, it's, really, it's really changed over the years. And, and I think, you know, I don't speak for most academics, you know, after you're gone, you know, you, your work you know, probably lives mostly through your students. Um, and I hope that to be the case. And I also want to leave some legacies behind, some tools for people they help change the, change the field a little bit. So this is, a, this is an interesting question, uh, very specific. So our faith partner, which is the church, has uh, been asking a returning offender to stop taking his meds and, and to allow prayer to work in his life. So comment on that. Forget about it. <laughs> now, I never say that I work with a lot of faith-based organizations. Um, these are folks that, that I think will, will go into prisons or go into neighborhoods. I mean, my hat's off to them. I work with a lot of those organizations, but what I say to them is the same thing I say to the state organizations. You need to pay attention to the research. You need to pay attention to what works. You need to pay attention to, to how you work with offenders. If you think that simply you know, turning them over to a higher power is gonna, is gonna, gonna, gonna do the trick, I, I think you're going to be disappointed at the end. Um, it's, it takes more than that. Doesn't mean that some people don't, you know, don't find a faith and salvation and turn their lives around. That, that that certainly happens. But I'm in the correctional program business. How do we create programs? How do we how do we train staff? 
And that's not something, it's, you know, it's a whole spirituality question. I, I, I don't know how to measure what's in somebody's heart and, and, and how, they, how they view that they're, they're supreme being. Uh, so I have to deal with the real world of how do I teach them some skills and, 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 and how, to, how to be successful when they get into situations. And if, if their God helps them do that, that's great. But I want to make sure they know how when, when they get out so that they have a chance at success. So I'm going to ask you two priorities questions. First priority question is uh, for a program. You uh, you try to help people who are uh, reentering from uh, from institutional corrections or have just been sentenced uh, and have been in jail awaiting sentencing. Uh, what are the priorities you would think about uh, as a program? What would you get in place first? What would you get in place second? Well, first is assessment. Uh, there's been some discussion with that. You think about it. Almost anything you want to fix starts with assessment. If you want to fix your car, you take it to the mechanic, right? You want them to do what? Hook it up to the computer. You want them to ask you some questions. You go to the doctor, you have a heart condition. First thing the doctor, if you want to take your blood pressure, your temperature, ask you some questions, do some tests. So assessment is necessary. It's not sufficient. Just because you assess people doesn't mean you do anything else. But without assessment, the chances that you're going to match them to the right programs, the chances that you're going to know what you're dealing with, go way, way down. So I would say the first thing to get your house in order is you take a look at how do we assess the people that are coming through our doors, whether it's on the front end, whether it's coming out of prison. Not everybody that comes out of prison needs a lot of programs, needs a lot of support. Some of them come out, they got a job waiting, they got a family waiting. You know, they learn their lesson. Others come out. You know, and they don't think drugs are their problem. They think the government was their problem. And, and, and so those are folks who probably ought to be more worried about. So I would say number one is assessment. Uh, that would be number one. And number two, I would say, uh, and I'll give three. I'll give four. Okay. Number two is you know, make sure your programming is targeting um, criminogenic risk factors. Doesn't mean that you don't address other needs. People have other needs. But our, our, our model is about 80-20. About 80% criminal genetic, 20% no. So that's the second thing we look for. Are we, do we have the right target? The third is, are we hitting the target? The third is, make sure you have action-oriented, good behavioral programs. I like curriculum-driven programs, and the reason is simple, because it gives people something to follow. It allows you to do quality assurance. Let me tell you what happens in this business. There's a lot of turnover in this business. So when you hire somebody new, if you don't have a program in place, you know what they're delivering? The last place they were. And so if you want your program delivered, you have to have a program in place. And the final point, and it's really the toughest. Steve alluded to it. The toughest is quality assurance. But that never ends. You have to constantly be monitoring and, and, and making sure your staff have the skills and things are being done right. So those are really the elements. But you start, it always starts with a good assessment. So the second priority question is about, is about us. Uh, you, know, you know the state of New Jersey uh, fairly well. And, um, you also know uh, Rutgers uh, pretty well. Uh, where you have this new, uh, very new uh, institute uh, just started under uh, Guidance of the Attorney General's office. Mm -hmm. What are our priorities? What do you think our priorities are? Well, I, I can't I can't name them all with regard to other areas. You know, I mean, at the university, I do corrections. I have colleagues that do crime prevention, policing, uh, and so they take an evidence-based approach and do that kind of work. My work's in corrections. If you're asking what the priority of corrections is here, I would say. The first thing to do is to take a look at what you're currently doing. And that involves re some research. Going in, looking, you know, New Jersey spends a lot of money, you have a lot of programs out there, you have a fairly sophisticated reentry process. I, I would start with where Ohio started. We started with research. We looked at the data. What did it say? Don't put low risk people in programs. Some programs aren't very effective. You know, then from there you start to decide. How do you fix them? Which ones don't you want to fund? And so forth. So, and some things can go on simultaneously, but until you have some good data around what's working in New Jersey and what isn't, 
I think that's the place where you're going to start. Okay, so I, 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 we're just about ready to take a lunch break. I see if they're still putting the lunch out. So I'm going to take uh, questions from the floor. I know that's a second. Yeah. Right. Have you, um, in this new process of uh, building curriculum, mm -hmm. is, has that changed uh, your thinking about the content of the assessment now? Or the question is, in the, in the building of curricula, do you, has this changed what you think about the content of the assessment itself, or are they uh, fitting together? Uh, it hasn't changed as much around assessment. Really, it's, it's the curriculum we, we check, we wrestle with. Because I think there's a tendency, and I don't want to be accused of doing the same thing, of of, as I said, creating kind of send them to this group for this, and send them to this group for this. When in fact, most of these these things are integrated. You know, if you look at substance abuse with offenders, about half of the substance abusing offenders started their antisocial behavior before their substance. You start asking them, did you finish school? Did you ever have steady work? I mean, you know, and, and, and you see that it's just part of their lifestyle. So one of the challenges we've had is, you know, We've been asked, can you design this curriculum for this particular need? And we've kind of done that, but I don't necessarily think that's the best way to do it. Uh, I like a, a model where if I teach you certain skills, I, I, I've worked on your attitudes, and it helps you to understand why this is the wrong way to go. And, and so if I'm working on skills, I can then teach you how to apply those skills, whether it's at work, or with your family, or with your spouse, or with your with your friends. Offenders often don't they, they, they don't see that. You know, they see I have a substance abuse problem. No, you have a lot of issues here. So so we've wrestled with that a little bit. It's it's been a challenge. We are designing, I should tell you, a very exciting project. We are designing a new sex offender curriculum. Uh, we partnered with the Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Correction and the Volunteers of America. Um, it's about halfway done. A lot of challenges there uh, with, with sex offenders because of the diversity of sex offending behavior and so forth. But, and the reason I, I took on the project was because there's a lot of good sex offender treatment going on. Don't get me wrong. But it's usually because they have a psychologist or good staff that know a lot about sex offenders. The problem is when they leave, the program leaves. And so we're trying to create a curriculum that will be public domain. We, we give our stuff away. That could be used in any state. And we're, we're designing it for prisons, halfway houses, and also for use with uh, field supervision. So um, those kind of things we're doing because we don't see a lot of, of things in its place. I'm not interested in doing things that other people do when they do it really well. I mean, you know, we're a university, and I think Rutgers is going to be the same way. You know, once we develop something, we want it to get out, and then we go on to something else. Uh, it's not that there isn't some good stuff out there, but, um, you know, those folks make money. They're selling it. That's, you know, that's what they're in business for. That's not what we're in business for. There actually have been some studies of, of AA programs. There is some literature out there. There was a meta-analysis. And it's interesting what it found, because what it, what it found was that people that were required to go did worse, right? And, and, and you think about it for a minute. AA was, you know, come from Ohio. I mean, it was designed Akron, Ohio. A doctor, a stockbroker developed it. it was, it's designed to be voluntary and anonymous. For correctional populations, it's neither. And, and so we force people to go into a model that they don't believe in, that they don't buy into. We hope they connect. They sign them in. And we wonder why it's not working. It wasn't designed that way. I think, it, it, I always tell people, if you have an offender and they want to work 12-step, they want to work AA, encourage them. But if you think forcing somebody into that particular modality will be effective, 
you'll be very disappointed. The data just doesn't, doesn't support it. So there have been some studies. The other problem I think with AA in particular is, especially when you make them go to meetings, there's no quality assurance mechanism. I mean, you know, the people sign them in and, and, and they're gone. I mean, you don't know what they're doing, if they're, if they're actually engaged and so forth. So that's another problem when you just require, if that's your whole treatment for substance abuse, you, you get, you're probably not going to get very far. Okay, so uh, let me ask you, 